Are you ready? Right here, we have another Instagram live and we've got one that's going to be quite topical at the moment, I feel. This is going to be a pretty good one. Um, we all know what's happening in the world with uh, the coronavirus. We all know what's happening in and around the world with... Animals. We have an animal guru with us. We have somebody who is just waiting to join and I think he's going to connect any second. Now, there he is. <laughs> Hi, Kev. How are you, buddy? I'm very well. How are you? Very, very good. Very good. What's happening? Not much. Yeah, just uh, autumn's kicking in, so it's getting dark early and cooler at night, which is welcomed. So yeah, all good. How's, how's lockdown on the on the farm or on the in uh, with the, all the animals? Yeah, well, life doesn't change much for me. I still have to go into work to uh, look after the cats, but uh, obviously things are a bit quiet because there's no tourism um, mm. and and you know. Uh, no volunteers or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, from that perspective, it's quiet, which in one respect I'm enjoying because uh, a lot more time to spend around the animals and it's a lot more peaceful. <laughs> but what happens in terms of the volunteer situation? How does, how do you, I mean, how many animals, how many, what, what animals have you got? We've seen you, you're the lion man. What animals have you got? Uh, currently, 24 lions. Uh, we have 11 spotted hyena, four black leopards and two striped hyena. And that's that's it. Uh, obviously, black leopards. My, yeah, black leopards. Yeah. Jesus, how do you feed them? Uh, we we luckily enough have a lot of uh, people in the area who know uh, that we have a sanctuary there, and they donate carcasses. So when animals in the vicinity pass on, we offer the service to go and collect and bring them back and feed. So you d you develop relationships with people, yeah, um, and and you deliver a good service. They're going to keep on contacting you to come pick up more. So, yeah, that's what we do. The twenty four lions, leopard, hyena. If you've got no volunteers, <laughs> are you doing all the feeding? Well, I, I have a team uh, staff, and we we all uh, kind of contribute. Yeah. So yeah, you got you got to do what you got to do to make sure the animals are fed and happy. So, yeah, it's a commitment. It's a commitment yes. for life, basically. Do you, live, yeah. do you live on the property or do you live off the property? I actually, uh, I used to live on the property many years ago, um, yeah. but made a decision with, with having kids um, that, you yeah, know, it's more conducive to me uh, uh, traveling in and out every day. So, yeah, travel, travel in every day and, yeah, see, go home at night. And do you have the animals? Do people live there on, on the, in the sanctuary? And, and how big is the sanctuary? I mean, lots of people will be, I mean, this is obviously such a topical uh, conversation, purely from what everybody's been watching on Netflix with Tiger King. How big yeah. is your sanctuary? Is it, is it zoo-like? Or, or do the animals have huge, huge plains, African plains to roam? Well, so we we basically part of a big five game reserve and the area of, of uh, uh, land that we are on actually spans a thousand, uh, just under a thousand three hundred hectares. And then the sanctuary is in the southeastern corner of that. But because these were animals that come from the lion petting industry, they cannot just free roam within the reserve. That's that's big five. So right. they need to be they need to be contained. That's that uh, is restricted by permits. But what right. I do, what I do with them, uh, which which obviously is is controversial, is I take those animals out and I let them walk in uh, bigger areas to give them a quality of life. Otherwise, they are simply, in my opinion, just lions in cages. And uh, in many respects, a lot of the the sanctuaries that I know and a lot of the other facilities that I know that these animals are just cats in cages. Um, my mandate is when these animals die, that's it. So a lot of the lions in my care are way over 12, 13 years of age. And so in the, in the years to follow, that number is going to go from 24. In fact, in the last uh, half a year, we've lost three to various age-related illnesses, one to leukemia. Um, so these animals are going to go down and down and down. And my um, ideal would be to see none of them in captivity anymore. Because I think even mm. 
from my perspective, even rescuing animals from, uh, you know, poor conditions and then putting them in cages um, perpetuates lions or tigers or whatever in cages. Uh, so I'd like to personally, I'd like to see an end to all of that period. And um, when, when, when you work, when you've worked so closely with these cats for so long, over two decades now, you start to realize what makes a lion tick. And there's yeah. so much more than just having them in a, in a, a in an enclosure and giving them food and water and thinking that that's okay. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's not okay. And I think it's a progression of learning that it's not okay. So it's really great to speak to you because you come from a, I mean, you're a cricketer turned conservationist. Um, I, I'm sure conservation or animals has always been um, yeah. something high on your agenda. Yeah. But but it's nice to see you um, advocating for the animals now. Uh, your audience um, is a new audience for me. So yeah. it's really good to speak to you because you can reach, uh, you know, different audiences by connecting with people like yourself. And, and that's why uh, I, I suppose I ask you these questions because um, people see Lion Man, they see the dudes in America, they see all these people that um, uh, facilitate caged animals, they hear all the mm. stories about uh, canned lion hunting, the lion bone trade, they hear all mm. these different bits and pieces of information. And I suppose from, from my side, it's, it's, it's the question of captivity. How do these animals feel happy in mm. the space that you've got them in? I mean, I've seen yeah. some beautiful images on social media of late where you've got, oh, we're not happy in isolation and there's pictures of zoos how, and an elephant is kept and how a lion is kept. Yeah. How big it's, does the space need to be, do you think, for these animals to feel happy? Your lions. Yeah. How big does the so, space need to be? So it's all, it's all relative and it's all putting it into perspective. So uh, personally, um, you know, lions that are born in a captive environment, what, what, they, what they need, what needs to be prevented is boredom. So when, uh, when, when, so when humans are confined, what, what, what do we hear people saying the most? We say, oh, we get bored. Yeah. Now, our, our, our liken it to our houses be now, is, is our houses are like a lion uh, enclosure. Let's, sure. let's put it that way. Now, if we didn't get out of our enclosures and go out to the shops or out to the, the park or yeah. to, to your lodge in South Africa or wherever you go, you you would go batshit crazy um, in in your house permanently, yeah. Yeah. and this has always been my my uh, belief and feeling as to why my relationships actually um, pave a way for these animals to live a better quality of life. Not saying that it is the way of the future. I'm just saying simply for the animals in my care at this point in time, when they die, they die. I'm not replacing those animals. The do, they breed, will, do they breed on your, in your sanctuary? Nope, no breeding. Because if you're breeding, you're perpetuating the yeah. problem. Yeah. So many, many years back, I said, uh -uh, this is it. I'll, I will care for you guys. The, uh, my mandate was to care for these specific animals for a specific. And I get a lot of criticism for it saying, oh, you only love your lions. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not, it's not the case that I, it's like I can't, I can't um, advocate welfare for my neighbor's dog and my neighbor's neighbor's dog. And uh, I like dogs but yeah. I can't be responsible for all dogs. So yeah. the point being is a lot of people shouldn't be keeping dogs as pets or, or cats as pets. Now, when you bring uh, big cats into the equation, it's a whole different ball game. Mm. What, I say to, what I say to people is the following. Imagine a bird, okay? So you rescue a bird from a bad place. It's been abused and yeah. now you take us, and, and let's take an apex bird, like a bird of prey. And we take yep. it and we put it in a, an aviary. And it's a, it's a better sized aviary than the aviary that the bird potentially came from. Yeah. Which, which bird would you rather be? Okay. Would you rather be a bird that's put in that aviary, left hands off, you get food, you get water, uh, and you get a few enrichment toys, that's it. Or the bird that's at a sanctuary where the, the keeper takes the bird out, lets the bird fly, the bird of prey fly, and it, it, it goes back to that place at night. That's what I do for my lions. I let them go out and have a better quality of life by being able to walk in bigger areas. And then they go back to one and a half, two hectare enclosures. So the enclosures walk, do you walk are not... Them, do you walk them like a dog? No, not, not like a dog, because there's definitely no lead. <laughs> so, no, I know. I mean, look, yeah. on, on, out here where we are in the woods, we can take the leads off and the dogs just cruise. Do you, yeah. What do you do? Do you just let them go? 
Yeah, yeah. You let them out into the area and let them walk, and they 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 respond. They 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 know after a certain period of time they're tired. They actually uh, be, being animals that have lived in captivity for so long. They actually want to go back to their place of safety, which is where they live. Yeah. But when you leave them in that place of of, of safety for uh, extended periods of time and you don't mix it up they go crazy. They don't, like any other animal, I'm not just talking about lions, I'm talking about any other animal, it's yeah. not a quality of life. If you did that to your dog, your dog would also not have a quality of life. Imagine yeah. you had a dog and you left it in your backyard and you never gave it any stimulation or any interaction and you just left it there. You gave it food and water. That, that's, the, that's the life of a lot of these animals. So let's, so really let's, just, so let's just clear this up from, for people that you're, you, how did you get involved in this? Because... People will be looking and going, oh, you've just got, you've got wild animals, just let them yeah. go. Why did you get them? How did you get involved in this? And, and how did these lions end up in your sanctuary? Yeah, so it's a, that's a really good question. So rewind the clock back to 1998. Yep. I was a 22, 23-year-old uh, young man, uh, had a passion for animals since a young boy. And I had an opportunity to go to a lion park. And it was quite a well-known lion park. In, in Johannesburg and uh, you know I knew nothing about it but uh, I went there and I met two six month old lion cubs and they'd, they'd come off the, the cub petting uh, rounds because they were now too big they were six months old and, and these just two lions explain the cub petting cub petting for people that go what is cub petting how can you just pet a, pet a lion yeah exactly so in South Africa we have this massive problem uh, where there's over 300 breeding facilities where a lot of them all around the country offer cub petting. So you can come for a fee and you can pay a fee to come and interact with a little lion cub between the age of three months and six months. Okay. And get a photo with it and you can do all yeah. of those kind of things. And then those lion cubs, when they get bigger to say six, uh, six to eight to 12 months, uh, the, these facilities do a walking kind of experience with them too, whereby you can't, there's a certain age limit, okay? Yeah. So um, then those lions grow up and then they become a liability to a lot of places. So they get either sold onto a facility that facilitates hunting um, mm. or they get sold to breeding facilities that breed more lions for hunting. And even now, as, as you well know, there's also this lion bone trade where yeah. uh, lions are slaughtered for their bones and it's sold to uh, yeah. Asia. Yeah. So, yeah, the, these, this facility that I started working at, I fell in love with these two lion cubs and I, I was completely smitten. And as, as you start to mature and as you start to evolve as a young man, and as you, and you've got to remember, uh, Kevin, back in 1998, social media didn't exist. No. The, internet, the internet was in its infancy. Mm. Um, we all didn't really know what this internet was about and Google and what, and nowadays yeah. at the touch of a button, you can, you can basically get information about anything. Yeah. Um, social media, I would never be having this conversation with you back in 1998 no. because f firstly, you wouldn't have, you would have been inaccessible. I would never have be, ever been able to make contact with Kevin Peterson. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, social media is definitely uh, enabled us to be able to get these messages out to broader audiences all around the world. Um, so your so your so your lions that you started off with in 1998, you got a couple of them and you got them from a um, a lion park who was going to either sell them off to canned hunting, sell them off to um, whoever it is. But you thought, mm -hmm. no, I've got a great relationship with these animals. I'm going to bring them up because you no, can't so, release you can't release yeah. animals that have been uh, hand reared into the wild. Is that right? Lions. Well, well, yeah. So, so there's many reasons why. Um, let's go back a bit. I mean, the lions yep. that, that I started working with, um, I started actually working at the facility and, uh, you know, started into, started developing relationships with all these animals and, and, and then slowly but surely started to um, ask more questions. And then the moment you start to ask more questions, you start to, see more things and you start to enlighten yourself back then it was a slow burn and and what what i quickly began to realize is that i was involved with something 
that I didn't really um, want to be involved with. However, I had forged bonds with these animals that I didn't want to turn my back on either. Mm. So that, that was the conundrum for me back then. And, and yes, I mean, it, it, took a, it took a long time and there was benefits um, for me. And, and the other thing was, was is that I was, didn't have the resources back then to just say, hey, okay, well, I, I've, I've seen the, the light of day here. Um, now I'm out of here. I'm going to take all my, my furry friends and go and set up my own establishment. It just wasn't as simple as that. Mm. Um, so, yeah, to get to, to, get to your, your, the other question about releasing lions into the wild, captive bred lions and, and many of these facilities around South Africa, the, the original breeding stock had come from circuses that had lions from abroad, from the UK. So the Chipperfield Circus had lions that were originally imported into South Africa to start these parks. So the genetics, number one, of these animals is not known. I mean, a lot of these animals are, t are really badly inbred because there's no concern for a pedigree. Um, mm. th th that wasn't the purpose of the business. Never has been. So that's the one aspect. Even if you had areas to release these captive lions into, um, which you don't, I'll get to habitat loss in a second, but even if you had the areas, you would be uh, being irresponsible as a conservationist by uh, releasing these brucks, so to yeah. speak, or these pavement specials into the wild. Habitat loss is the biggest threat that lions face in the wild today. Yeah. So, all, so animals. No, all animals, quite right. And apex predators feel it the, yeah. the, 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 the hardest, you know. So what I always say to people is it's like this romantic notion of freeing up the 10 to 12,000 captive lions, 10 to 12,000 in captivity in South Africa. This romantic notion of freeing them all is just a pipe dream. It's, it, it's not going to happen, guys, so to, to realize that. Yeah. In South Africa, our lion population, believe it or not, is actually stable, if not, um, if not on the increase. Uh, it's a very different model in South Africa to, as it is to all the other uh, countries in Africa where – they don't have these managed fenced reserves. Yeah. You know, our, our, our reserve, our model has always been to kind of fence the animals um, from the people and the people from the animals. Yeah. Now, in other parts of Africa, like uh, uh, Tanzania and Kenya, we're having a, 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 a conflict with a burgeoning human population. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that is what is happening to the lion populations there. They're coming more and more into conflict with, with humans and, and they meet their demise because, you know, lions are never going to win over, over humans. So, you know, conflict with cattle, there's preemptive killings, there's uh, reactive killings to the, to the lions killing their cattle. There's, mm. there's, 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 there's decreased meat due to the bushmeat trade. Yeah. So that's also an impact. Um, sure, in certain areas, there's also very poorly managed trophy hunting. That is a threat to wild lions. It's not, it's not the biggest threat which a lot of people like to believe. So, yeah. How can a, how can a human be a part of a pride? <laughs> well, lions are very social animals. So um, if you learn to um, work with them on their level and you learn to not try and control them and dominate them and make them become, uh, you know, trained dogs, uh, which they're not, but you understand them. And I knew nothing about lions when I started working with lions back then, by the way. And as I started to learn about their behavior, I started to realize that everything I thought I knew about lions was wrong. And actually, these animals were portrayed in a light that didn't really suit them. Um, yes, a lion has big you know, fangs and it's an apex predator yeah. and it's very powerful. But lions have an, a, an immense uh, ability to recognize and to be affectionate for those uh, uh, who grow up in their, their groups, especially when they're young. So they have this huge affinity when they're young. And that's, that's what people exploit, that niceness of lions when they are younger. But when they get older and they're very set in their ways, they're kind of like humans. You know, when we get to a certain age, we're like, eh, I don't like that guy. You know, yeah, but surely, 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 yeah, I don't like that guy. And if we have a little bit of a hissy fit and we lash out once... One little lash out's taking that head of yours right off, surely. No, it's not like that at all. You know, otherwise, 22 years down the line, I wouldn't be talking to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and interacting with lions on a daily basis, I wouldn't be talking to you. So that is uh, a misconception 
that when a lion has uh, has a um, a bad mood day, he's just going to kill you. It doesn't happen like that. Um, and 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 their relationships with you, just like with people, um, they they in fact, I, I said to somebody the other day, quite surprisingly, they were surprised to hear this, that the lions pick up when I'm in a bad mood. And if I'm in a bad mood and I walk into that enclosure or that area where the lions are, they they stay the hell away from Kevin. And really? they like pick, absolutely, they pick up. This is the thing that I'm trying to get through to the world is that they're not just this on and off switch. A lion mm. is is an animal that has a lot more going on in its head. And if you knew lions the way I know them, you wouldn't be um, happy to see lions just being kept in enclosures. It, 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 it kills me to see lions yeah. just being kept in enclosures. I'm sorry. Uh, and that's why I made a decision many years back. I said to myself, I, I don't want to perpetuate this. Therefore, I don't want to breed. But certainly, I don't want to take on any more rescues. So a lot of people say to me, Kev, now that your lions are passing away, you have some areas that are freeing up. Can you take some more animals in? Uh, help all the lions in South Africa that are destined for these slaughter farms. And yeah. I'm like, I don't want to do that, guys. I think my, my time with keeping lions in cages is over. It's coming to an end. And when I close that chapter, I'll be a happy man. I'll be like you. And I'll go on to something else. You know what what's, I mean? what's been, your, what's been your, uh, your worst injury? You must have had some. Don't talk shit. Don't sit here and say, no lines bitten me, no lines scratch me. Bullshit. You know, the, I'm telling you, Kev, the, 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 the worst injury I've had from a lion, not from a hyena. Hyenas have put me in hospital many times through bites. Really? Okay? And that, yeah, and that requires uh, stitching because hyenas can be, their, their, their ability to give you a warning or their warning is very quick. So they'll give you a warning, but then if you don't heed that warning very quickly, they will challenge you. So hyenas are extremely smart. Lions will give you a lot of warnings. What's so, a lion warning? Tell me, give me a lion warning. Tell everybody what a lion warning is. Oh, there's so many. I mean, one of, I mean, you would know from the bush. I mean, if you see a lion crouch down, ears back, tail flicking, it, it, don't go in and try and give it a hug. You know, that's not going to, yeah. that's, that's not going to end well, you know, um, but, but in terms of um, lines that you have a personal relationship with, a lion warning would be uh, just that, or just a flare of the lip, or just the eyes doing the, or the ears just flattening. So all these really? little, stuff, yeah, just little subtle signs. And you, you, he, you heed that warning and you say, thank you for the warning. Most of my injuries that have occurred through my relationships with the lions have been accidental. When a lion, say for example, jumps on you because it's so excited to see you and the claw cuts your lip or the claw right. cuts, your, cuts you somewhere. Yeah. It's not malicious. When I was younger um, and learning about lion behavior, I had a, a, a few uh, close encounters with lions that I didn't know personally. Yeah. And I thought to myself, oh, okay, I'm the regular doctor do little of lions. So I'm going to go and befriend all these lions, even big ones yeah. that, uh, that, that I didn't have a personal relationship with. And I often say to people, it's like your best relationship is with, you know, the people who are closest to you. And that starts with your family, like your kids and your wife. Hopefully. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, think, so, I think everybody's <laughs> is being tested at the moment. <laughs> I, think I had that conversation today with somebody who said to me, you know, one of the things that this uh, lockdown will do is it will see which relationships or which marriages are, are, are strong. <laughs> <laughs> at least you've got a day out. You can go and spend it with your animals. You lucky bucker. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, getting to hyenas, you said you've got hyenas, you've got leopards and you've got lions. Hyena, what's, what's the hyenas play? Because they are the things that I find so inquisitive in the bush. Yeah. I mean, leopards are, uh, lion, lions are said to be the biggest scavengers and those little things that freaking run around the bush and claim everything. However, hyenas are definitely the biggest scavengers. Well, sorry, no, lions are bigger scavengers. Correct. Than hyenas. Sorry, Correct. sorry. Yeah. That's right. Hyenas well, are said to be the biggest scavengers, yeah, but, but they're, they're, they're an animal that absolutely fascinates me. They're always, I mean, I watched them the other day on. Um, on a program and they'll just follow wild dogs and then they'll clean out a wild dog's kill. I mean, they're yeah. just, they're amazing animals. 
So I did a series um, back in 2015, around about then, on, uh, we called it Deadly Predator Challenge, but it was basically putting hyenas against lions in, in a set of cognitive challenges. And, and, you know, I had always known through working with hyenas how smart they were. But this, this series completely um, just showed how smart they were. I mean, these animals... Really? Oh my gosh, you, you know, my, one of my biggest um, missions in life, and I know you like hyenas, which is a great thing. Yeah. Um, we both called Kevin, we're both from South Africa, and we both love hyenas. So that's, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's three good things. Um, my mission in life, because when I started working with lions, I hated hyenas. I thought that hyenas were just put on this planet to give lions a hard time. Yeah. And I'd watched documentaries that had confirmed that belief. I'd watched, and I'd seen The Lion King. And mm. so I was completely convinced that hyenas were the bad guys here. And, and when I started um, a relationship with some hyenas way back when, and I started to see that these animals were so switched on. And, and the more I, 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 I figured how switched on they were, the more I had this thirst to gain more knowledge on hyenas. To the point where I'm sitting here talking to you and I'll tell you that a hyena in, in some cognitive experiments, in some problem-solving experiments where it requires uh, co cooperation between two individuals, two, two individuals, hyenas outcompete chimpanzees. Really? Which, really. So a lot of people go, what? They outcompete chimpanzees. So that shows the level of intelligence Jeez. of these animals. Yeah. So the clever bastards. Somebody, clever bastards. So when people say to me, hyenas are scavengers I'm, I'm like they're not scavengers they hunt up to 70 percent of what they eat but they are opportunistic just yeah. like you or i why yeah. are you going to go and hunt your steak when you can go and buy it in the shops yeah so so they wait for other animals to do all the hard work in some incidents like you 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 um, said about the wild dogs and then they're going you know try their luck they'll try their luck on a lion they'll try their luck on a leopard wherever they can try their luck because they're smart they're, they're masters of intimidation so yeah, they, they can are. ban yeah, they're banged together in these groups and yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I love it. I just think do they meet? Scary. Do they meet your lions at all, or do you keep no, them no, separate? No. Oh, absolutely. They they never. They, 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 they there's this there's this. Uh, you know, all predators somehow, unless they grow up together, they have this uh, inherent or primal hate uh, for each other. Yeah. So when you when you drive the the lions past the hyenas, the hyenas go mad. And the lions go mad. If you drive a hyena past the leopards, the leopards go mad and the hyenas go mad. So really? there's this, yeah, they don't like each other. But I have had cases in the past where a lion has grown up with a hyena and a hyena's grown up with lions. Yeah. And they're the best and they're the best of mates because they 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 they, they don't know any of those cultural differences, so to speak. And we yeah. know that with humans too. If you take away the adults and you just put all the children together, they all play nicely. As soon as you put the adults in the room, then all these racial tensions start to come to the fore. Let's get on to uh, the time's flying. Jesus, half an hour, we've <laughs> smashed this. Um, let's get on to, I think, with something that a lot of people want to know about. It's very topical at the moment, the ti uh, Tiger King. And these guys in America that uh, are taking each other on, one's now serving time. And there's different camps and breeding facilities and... Um, when I was shooting a documentary in India about a month ago, they were telling yeah. me um, there was a lady, her family, uh, her name is Kriti. She came and she spent some time with us and her father brought back tigers into India. So he saved the, the, the tiger species in India and brought them back to a, to a, um, to a number where, where it's fairly respectable, but they don't have enough space. So they don't have enough, uh, they don't have the population that they'd want. Now, I get back to London and I turn on a series that everyone's talking about, Tiger King. And I see these rather eccentric people brandishing animals and talking and carrying on. And you just look at it. And something that she said to me in India, she said there's more tigers in America than there are here in India and in Asia. And I was just, I said, shut up, Chris. I said, there's no way that's possible. You then get back here and I'll start watching this program and they start talking about this and you start seeing these facilities. Now, I suppose those situations are where fame meets money meets power. And the more money you have, 
sometimes you feel like you want to be famous. The more famous you have, you are, the more you actually feel I should have money. Now, from what I can see from that whole scenario, it's about them gaining so much traction, gaining so much familiarity, having so much, so many people coming. And the more they got famous, the more money they got, the more everything spiraled out of control. And I probably do believe to some degree that they do love the animals and they did love yeah. the animals. But initially. That's sort of, yeah, initially. Mm. But that, that, that passed by the wayside when they saw loot and they saw TV cameras. Yeah. Your facility, is your facility a zoo where people come in to check the animals? Do people pay yeah. daily fees to come and see you? No, because I think that model is, is, is flawed in the sense that educationally, people gain nothing from coming to a facility, I think, in my personal opinion. And there's no one really to guide them around and tell them, why are these animals here? You know, what, what is the history of this animal in this particular area, et cetera, et cetera. So we do three tours a week. Um, it's literally two, three hours on a Tuesday, Thursday, and a Sunday. That's it. Apart from that, the facility is not open to the public. Right. And I think, I think what happens with a lot of these facilities, just to touch on with the Tiger King, is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. The ego, the ego um, overtakes. And, and so what initially starts is people saying, hey, I really love animals, so it would be cool to get a, a tiger. Um, or it will be cool to get a lion. Now, it, it starts off with that notion. And, and, and what happens with a lot of people who have money, you talked about money, People with money say, well, everyone's got a dog and everyone's got a cat. I'd love to have something different. Why don't I get yeah. one of these Savannah cats? So they get yeah. a Savannah cat. Then a Savannah cat is not enough. So a Savannah cat is uh, it's not, okay, if, there's, there's 100 people with Savannah cats. I want something different. So I want a tiger or I want a, a leopard or I want a lion. I want something, um, you know, that, that, that's more. Um, well, that shows friend, it's a symbol of wealth. Oh, and, and power and power, yeah. you know. So, so for for me, um, the show. Oh man, I struggled to watch it. To be honest, I, so my following was what well, kept on asking me, um, Kevin, please give us your thoughts on the Tiger King. Please give it. Yeah. So, I, so I eventually I had to watch it, and and I, I struggled through watching seven episodes. But what I what I did find fascinating was the, was the absurdity of 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 these people. I mean, I suppose I understand why it's become such a hit is because people are fascinated with people. What saddened me was that the animals um, were just window dressing. They were just, they were yeah. just like props, props on a stage of a, of a production. Yeah. And, and so where they missed a the trick was highlighting the, the, the cruelty and the animal abuse that's going on in these facilities in America. And I mean, I don't know what the number is, but they say, it's between five and 10,000 tigers. How can it be between five and 10? That's a huge between, That's you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's so, so yeah, it's like in South Africa, they say there's between eight and 12,000 lions in captivity um, from these breeding facilities. I'm going, well, there's, there's 4,000 lions missing somewhere. You know, if it's, yeah. eight, if it's eight or 12, you know, it's, that's yeah. scary. It should be a case of just saying to the authorities, how many animals are there? Because it should all be permitted. But in America, there's four states in America. I, I was absolutely horrified. Wisconsin, Alabama, North Carolina, and one other, I think it's Oklahoma, one, of, one other state. You don't even need a permit to keep an exotic cat, a big cat. Don't Bloody need hell. a permit. Yeah. And in the other states, in the other states, which I found uh, fascinating, was the fact that... Um, even the permit conditions that you needed to keep a tiger weren't even that stringent. So it's no surprise that they have a problem um, mm -hmm. of, of, of that amount of tigers in captivity. But the sad reality, and I must emphasize this, is the conditions in which the animals are being kept. Um, yeah. And then this glorification of, of these people, um, you know, they, they almost yeah. made into these these um, docu, I don't know. Like, well, it's a docu like, series, like and I mean, it is. It's it's disgusting because now this guy is apparently enjoying such a famous lifestyle in prison, where he is at the moment for um, for for getting up to all the shenanigans that he's yeah. got himself into. Do you need Do you need permits? Have you got permits um, for your animals? Is that how it is? What's the What is the difference between um, America, where those guys have got tigers, and you and your lions? Yeah, so South Africa is quite um, strict in 
what we call threatened or protected species. And the threatened or protected species uh, line would fall into that. So there's, there's, there is stringent permitting. However, it differs uh, from province to province. So the province that I'm in is actually quite stringent and quite good. But then there's other provinces where these guys are getting away with murder, so to speak. And that's the problem in South Africa, is that there's no, um, there's no uniformity between the, the national norms and regulations. Um, so um, I think, yeah, South Africa needs to really tighten up on, on, on how these animals are kept too. We, we, we are not in many respects too different to what you saw on Tiger King in Netflix. Uh, it, it, it is a horror show in some of the places. Really? So there, yeah. so there are places in South Africa that are exploiting their animals and just making just money, money, money. It's just a vicious cycle of money. Oh, yes. So that is one thing that I've been speaking quite loudly against for many, many years. And, and, and having this opportunity again to speak to you and your audience is wonderful because we could yet again highlight the problem with coming to South Africa and going to a facility where you can interact with a, a, a lion cub. Um, in South Africa, uh, get this, actually you don't need a permit to keep what we call exotic big cats like tiger. So you don't need a permit. You need a permit to keep a lion. You don't need a permit to keep a tiger. You need a permit to move a tiger, not to keep a tiger. So what a lot of these people, so what a lot of these people do is they say, I woke up in the morning and there was a tiger dropped on my doorstep in a box. What was I to do? I, I kept it. And here it is in my back garden. Yeah, because yeah, that often happens, doesn't it? I mean, regularly exactly. we get tigers dropped off here. <laughs> and and that, you would be surprised, Kevin. I mean, you know South Africa, but in Johannesburg, in Bryanston, in Bryanston, there are tigers being kept illegally, okay, or legally, whichever way you want to look at it, Shut in, up. People's, in people's back gardens. Shut yeah. up. In people's back gardens, yeah. We just had about two tigers. weeks ago, tigers. We had a tiger on the loose in Benoni in South Africa, in Benoni. You could believe it, it's Benoni. No, no, but listen, Benoni. I was going to say, there's, been ta there's, there's plenty of tigers running around Benoni every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but, but this is the, uh, uh, jokes aside, this is the serious problem with, and I know you are quite friendly with Lord Ashcroft, and I believe you, 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 yeah. you interviewed him the other day. But, um, you know, he did this expose yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, um, and he he was exposing the tiger slaughterhouse, uh, not tiger, the lion slaughterhouses. The lion slaughterhouses, correct for their bones uh, to yeah. be sent to 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 the far east. Yeah, um, and and he exposed a, a particular farm called Vakabiki in the Free State. Now, in mm. the Free State, it's one of the the places that's notorious for for breeding um, lion and and other. Animals Why doesn't for, the for government in South Africa do something about it? Because I tweeted um, your health minister today. I, I forget his name. Zwili somebody. Mkhezi, yeah. Yeah, Zwili Mkhezi. Mkhezi, and, uh, Mkhezi he, yeah. Said, he said mm. he tweeted something the other day about um, the fact that we know where the coronavirus has come from. So, yeah. well, you know where the coronavirus has come from? It's wet markets. Yes, wet markets, but pangolins. Where are those pangolins coming from? How many pangolins are left in the wild in Africa? What's happening to the rhino? in Africa. What's happening, like Lord Ashcroft is unraveling, with the lion bone trade? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the South African government do something about the illegal wildlife trade? Because I know exactly what they do. They do fuck all. <laughs> Compared to what they're supposed to do, they do nothing. No, no. Well, the rhino course. is getting cleaned out. Yeah. The lions, there's lion farms everywhere. And uh, I think uh, Lord Ashcroft is bringing something out very, very soon, which is going to be very damaging for a lot of those places. Yeah. And it's, 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 I mean, you've got ministers and government talking about it. Why don't they do something about it? Okay, so I, I, I completely hear you and I completely agree with you because there's two ways, uh, there's two schools of thought. Um, one of the schools of thought is that we tell uh, the tourist who comes to South Africa, don't participate in uh, going to these petting facilities and sure. therefore if they didn't do sure. that. I, I find that a difficult one because... Um, the people that come and get educated, uh, the repeat of these people back to these countries. The world is such a big place. These people always coming in through our borders. And there's yeah. these brochures that you handed at the airport saying, come to our facility. We love our lines. Look, we pledge this, we pledge that. So that is a, I've seen this for, for, for over a decade. People saying, you know, let's educate the, the public. Let, I agree. Let's continue to educate the public. But I don't think that's going to be the silver bullet. Legislation change 
is the only thing that's going to stop this from happening. Absolutely. But your question, your question is why doesn't legislation change? Because there's no appetite for it to change because inherently they don't see anything wrong with exploiting the animals for monetary gain. That, that I'll tell you my belief is why it hasn't changed because we can see when the government wants to do something as in lock down the country due to coronavirus, it's done like that with a swipe yeah. of a wand. The country's locked down in three days. So if there was an appetite to stop the lion bone trade, to stop canned hunting, to stop cub, cub petting and, and irresponsible breeding of these predators, it would have been done two decades ago. Um, it, it hasn't happened because I don't think there's this appetite to change that. I think what, what the government perhaps sees is that it, 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 it um, encourages tourism, it encourages, it, 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 it's um, supporting maybe the, the jobs. Maybe, maybe, maybe the government's making loot out of it. Well, and that's what I just said. I mean, it, it's absolutely, it's a money-driven thing. There's, these jobs, this tourism, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So, you know, if you don't really care that much about the line, because then we could say, well, what about, um, you know, feedlots? And what about chicken farms? And what about piggeries? And what about all these other places where animals are being treated atrociously yeah, and then yeah, just yeah. slaughtered? Yeah. We, we, we're going down a rabbit hole. So what, what we need to do is we need to um, kind of put pressure, I think, on, on, on government to say that this is, it's, 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 it's antiquated and people don't want to um, associate with it. Put and enough think, pressure and then maybe there'll be a, a, a folding. And, and, and I and, think and when you talk about Africa and South Africa closing its doors now, I mean, I'm, I'm from South Africa and I know what's happening there. I speak to my mates and my family every single day. And I mean, goodness knows what would happen. I mean, I can't even get into South Africa if something happened to any of my family while uh, um, in well, South I'm Africa now. So mm. when you have a look at that you and you think about the root of, of the evil and find, a, find out exactly where it came from and what's caused this global crisis, surely this has, been, has to be enough for conservationists, for people like yourself to be able to put pressure on the government to say, guys... We probably need to assist those people that are working in these national parks, saving these animals. A lot of these people used to just be people that loved the bush. They're conservationists. They wanted to make sure the vegetation was right. They wanted to make sure that they did the fire breaks. They were just counting mm. species. They're yeah. now walking around the Kruger National Park or some of, a lot of these private game reserves, which massive guns, and they're in a full-on war. Now, when you've got people like that, who I feel incredibly sorry for, who I'm quite close to, to lots of them, when their lives are in danger because they're protecting the animals, the animals that they're protecting are getting fleeced. They're then ending up in China or wherever they're ending up. This has then caused a global crisis where people are losing their, uh, losing their jobs. People are committing suicide. People don't know what to do when they wake up the next day. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty tragic place where we're sitting at the moment. And... I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's about humans, humans, humans right now. Yes, it is. And there's a lot of people doing things about yeah. humans. And there are a lot of amazing people. Our NHS here, the front line in South Africa, in America, all these brilliant people helping save people's lives. But we are have an opportunity now to bang the drum home on what I've been doing and what obviously you do. For the last seven years, I've been smacking the drum about the illegal wildlife trade. I mean, this mm. has caused this garbage. It's done it before with SARS. HRV, Mers, well, all these. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like Fire. we have the perfect opportunity now to go, stop this. So, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, they, 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 when this all started, China banned these wet markets and the, and, and the sale of uh, a wild animal uh, trade. But, but recently we've heard that those markets have started up again. Yeah. And uh, or, or it's business as usual. Uh, yeah. the, only the only difference being is that now there's no cell phones allowed to record undercover footage of what's going on. So it's, it's, it's a cultural change. I think a lot of these, um, a lot of these problems are, are, are dealing with culture and how do we now change this culture into realizing that, you know, we can't keep on going down this same road. Um, it's a difficult one. I think, I think if we had of um, if, if, if there was easy solutions, it would have already, it would have already transpired. So you quite rightly say it's it's a frustration, it's a war, 
And the more, the more I get to know about um, what's going on, the more helpless I feel. I felt like, yeah. tw- you know, 15, 20 years ago when I knew absolutely nothing, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And the more you know, the more frustrated you become and the more you start to get angry about, about why governments aren't listening or uh, somebody just in the comments there was saying, oh, it's all about money, you know, and, and, and yeah, I can't disagree with that. I think it's a sad state of affairs because mm-hmm. obviously we work so closely with um, a lot of um, uh, people in Africa. Uh, I was just recently in Botswana in the Okavango Delta and I was with um, some of the um, uh, people who are conservationists up there and they look after the rhinos in Botswana. And, I mean, I've had bad numbers come back in the last few weeks talking about uh, what's happening up there. And it's tragic just to see that people will continue. The South African leaders or the African leaders won't come together and say, we've got to protect our animals. I mean, tourism is everything. I mean, you have a look yeah. at the tourism now. I mean, I've had to close my lodge. Yeah. We've, we're paying everybody fully because I think it's the right thing to do. We're in a position yeah. where we can pay them to make sure that yeah. they can look after themselves. But there's the a lot of yeah. camps. There are a lot of lot lodges. I mean, the tourism industry is flat. And how well, big is that? And what a big contribution to the GDP in Africa is tourism. Listen, Kevin, I think what's, what's, what's really scary is the aftermath of all of this. So once... Yeah, everything opens up again and people overseas, um, you know, think to themselves, how, OK, am I going to go on holiday to, to, to South Africa now? Well, there's no money. So, no, maybe that holiday that I was always dreaming of, I'm going to put off for another two, three years or whatever. You know, so tourism in South Africa is going to be affected for a long, long time to come. I know personally many, yeah. many people in tourism, uh, tour guides, uh, tour yeah. operators, yeah. Um, lodges, uh, many, many people personally, and they're going, Kevin, if, if things don't change drastically in the next month, we are going under. Yeah. Um, this is the that's, sad that's reality. All, that's all the world around. That's yeah. all the world around. But 100%. This, what's, where, was, where did this all come from? Where does it yeah. continue to come from? And no, another I thing, I read a fascinating article, and I don't know who it, it was published a, a couple of days ago, about the lime bone trade. And if they don't stop the lime bone trade, there's going to be another pandemic that's going to yeah. come that's going to hit us harder than the one we've got at the moment. So anyway, yeah. anyway, I, I, dude, I, I, need, I need to go and have dinner soon. I've got a couple more for you. Do you ever get scared of your animals? Have you ever been in a situation where you get incredibly scared of your animals? Um, no, it's, it's kind of, uh, I think you get to a point where you know them and their personalities so well that you can say, you know, I can see so-and-so is in a bad mood today, just leave him alone. And, and the, you, can, you can read a lot by what the other animals or the other lions are doing too. So you also, over the years, develop a very fine-tuned gut instinct or sixth sense. And so you definitely are, are paying attention to all of those things. So I don't think the right word is scared, but I think the right word is respectful. And I think as soon as you have this... Um, respect for them. And I I must say, back in my youth, when I was younger, um, I approached working with the lions very differently, like like, like I do now. Um, Because I was a young guy, and I was kind of like, happy-go-lucky, and you know, I can conquer the world. You know how a young testosterone-filled lighty is, you know? (laughs) And (laughs) you can relate to that, because I know you were also, you were like that. (laughs) And and, 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 you know, so you change and, and, and we change for the better, I hope. I hope we change for the better. You know, over the, over the last two decades, I've, I've really changed my approach a, a, as to how I work with the animals and how I look at them and how I perceive them. And, and I think that uh, puts you in a good place uh, working with them. And, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a horrible question, but it's pertinent because Steve Irwin working with... Um, animals the way that he worked with animals all over the world and unfortunately it came to he came to the end with the, with everything do you worry do, is there any fear inside of you that things one day one of these hyenas or one of my lions are just going to go good night uh, again kevin i mean t- over two decades of working with them if i had of um if, if, if that had have entered into my mind i think it would have happened over a decade ago you know so we all realize i always use this analogy 
You know, when you hop into your car every day, if I had to ask you, Kevin, do you realize that this car is a very dangerous thing and you could die in this car? You would answer me, Kev, yeah, I, I do realize that a car can be lethal. Um, but I don't think about it every day when I get into my car because if I did that, I wouldn't get into my car every day. Yeah. When I look at the statistics yeah. of how many people die on the roads every day in South Africa, you should be pooping in your pants getting into your car in South Africa and driving on our roads. But you don't. You get into your yeah, car but and people you don't, don't. But, 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 but hold on. Driving a car is not the same as walking around with lines, brother. <laughs> I, yeah, walking around with lines, knowing them the way I do, is safer than getting in your car. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And, and, and you know what? The other thing I laughed at somebody the other day, I was saying, you know, and all of you guys were saying that lions were, 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 were so dangerous, but actually it's people. I'm scared of people now. You know, I don't want to contract con coronavirus. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like terrified of people. <laughs> don't blame me. Get back to your animals. <laughs> yeah. um, I suppose the final thing that we're going to leave, leave this on is um, it has been a chat about captive animals, captivity, the way that you've got into it, the way that you've uh, progressed over the last couple of years. And as, uh, I mean, 22 years now you've been doing this. Yeah. Um, I think it's important for people to know that you're not breeding animals yeah. and that when your last animal leaves you, that'll be the time that you close up your gates and say, you did something for the animals that you rescued. Yeah, correct. I mean, that is a good, a good place to leave it. Um, the, the sanctuary, people ask me, well, what would happen to all those expensive areas that have been built? And I've been in conversation with many wildlife vets and rehabilitation places that w would see a need to, to utilize those facilities only for animals that would come in there temporarily to be released back to the wild. So the condition right. of an animal entering into that enclosure would be that it is rehabilitated and released. If it's an animal that cannot be released, I wouldn't want them at my place. That's, that's, that's the mandate. Uh, because we really don't want to, my foundation, I set up a foundation two years ago, and we, the mandate is to see this come to an end, hopefully to see canned lion hunting come to an end and the mm. cub petting industry, uh, but to see my uh, lions um, live out their lives to the best that we can give to them. And then yeah. that's it. Close chapter, open new chapter, and hopefully do more things for good lions, uh, for wild lions, and do more good for um you know, lions in the wild. How can people support you, buddy? So we have, as I say, found Kevin Richardson Foundation. So you can go and look that up on the website, uh, kevinrichardsonfoundation.org. And go and look at what we uh, aim to achieve and what we do. And that's, yeah, that's how they can support. Or the other way to support is just, you know, go on Instagram, look at, uh, look at what we do, um, spread the message, tell a million of your closest friends not to come to South Africa and pet lions. Um, follow the YouTube channel, Line Whisperer TV, all of those kind of things all help. Wicked, buddy. Good on you, mate. Well, yeah, I wish you well. Thanks so much for uh, everything that you do. Um, and it's been a lovely chat. I think I've seen yeah. a lot of the messages flying up here. There's been millions. I mean, Kevin, you're so handsome. And I don't know whether they're talking that's, to me or you. you. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're saying, that's uh, for you. They're saying, are you bald? I'm not bald. I just had a dodgy haircut. There's no barbers around. Uh, I'm not sponsored by Diet Coke, no. So I was just very thirsty. Um, very informative. It's a, it's informative. Product, product placement. Yeah, product. I mean, <laughs> gracious. I mean, how bad is it? I can't even drink a Diet Coke. <laughs> oh, there she goes. <laughs> but brother, thanks so much. We'll keep in touch. Um, and I'll catch you when I come to South Africa. Hopefully all this Definitely. blows over. You stay safe in South Africa and the family. Look after yourself and wicked. Yeah. Thanks, Kev. All the best. Good on you, brother. It. Catch you, mate. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.